Hi, I'm Jeff. This is Tropical Plants at 53 degrees north. So we're just into February and the sun is beginning to go a little bit higher into the sky. So we've got some really good optimism in the greenhouse at the moment. There's one or two things beginning to move now. So we can all smile a little bit more and for a bit longer, hopefully. So we're going to go through all the greenhouse use for the beginning of February. So let's get cracking. And we are in okay another miserable day outside there's a tiny little bit of sun yesterday but not for very long for about an hour and then it started to rain again as per usual but having said that the sun is higher it's definitely higher because when it does come out i notice that the ridge of the greenhouse right at the top there uh, just begins to get a little bit of sun i mean you can see the grow lights through there through the other side but just at the top there, right along the edge, it's just beginning to get the sun. The sun comes round from that direction. It actually starts over in that direction, but it's blocked by trees. Comes round here and it's way too low at this time of year. Uh, gets round here, but the houses and the garage next door are actually blocking it totally from the greenhouse. So it's only really at this time of year that I begin to get a little bit of sun. But when it does come out, what you do notice straight away is that even though under these grow lights, it all seems really bright it's really a comparison to outside because actually when the sun does hit the greenhouse those grow lights just completely vanish and disappear and you really begin to realize the difference in the sun and when you do come out when the sun comes out uh, the intensity of light in here is so so much better than it is with the grow light and the plants really respond accordingly so even though i might feel that i've got this really bright light in here um, it's nothing compared to when the sun hits it and that's really what the plants have to cope with of course we as humans our eyes adapt to the light so we are not really getting a full picture of how intense the light is in here okay so just having a look around here and my eye is first drawn not to a bloom but to all the yellowing leaves on these three mandevilla cuttings and this is something that i didn't actually do this last year uh, but they do lose leaves and this is the time of year that they lose them. I have another one over in the other side, um, they're like a pink one, and that's lost practically all its leaves. But I'm not too worried because I feel that it will come back. I think, again, it's just the intensity of light and you've got these nice new growths coming here. The, the red one, the red mandevilla on the other side, uh, mandevilla sanderi, just doesn't seem to. It does lose leaves, but not, not to this extent. It doesn't lose a lot of them. So whether that's just a particularly strong cultivar, I don't know. Notice the sap coming out there, the latex. Um, yes, it is poisonous. Yes, it will supposedly anyway irritate your skin. Uh, no, I don't find that it does bother mine uh, unduly. Now, whether that's because I'm out gardening quite a lot, I don't know. Perhaps I've got really rough hands. I'd like to think I have. <laughs> it's a very manly thing. So, okay, what have we got? Begonia, so this is a Fuchioides. It looks really nice as a bunch like that, and they're quite long lasting as well, but that's even losing quite a few of its leaves there. And talking about losing its leaves, I really did worry about this uh, Bougainvillea here. So this one is, it's not much to look at at the moment, Bougainvillea brasiliensis, and it's lost every single leaf. And if you remember, you probably won't, but last year I really panicked and thought, it shouldn't be doing this and I cut it right back to the base right down here and when summer came along or when the temperatures warmed up in spring it re-sprouted re um, and I made a couple of videos on it and I was worried whether there was something in the soil or whether it caught something and everybody gave me their opinions on it and you know what I think it's basically just having a rest it just doesn't like um, and I'm thinking here I'm thinking that it is the temperature of 12 degrees and this is this is something that i'm thinking is a, a factor in quite a number of plants like the brugmansia which i'll show you in a second um, when you actually look up bougainvillea even on the rhs website it says that it's evergreen and it will keep its leaves all year round and when i think about the mediterranean which does get temperatures like below 12 degrees but i'm thinking that that is not permanent like for me all through December, well, most of November, all through December, I've got temperatures of 12 degrees in this greenhouse because the temperature outside is lower. So I'm thinking that these cannot cope for 
a, an extended length of time with temperatures at 12 degrees and what they do is they drop all the leaves and the really the way to check of course and you've probably seen this before oops i'm just kicking plants on the floor there is just to do that with your nail and you can see it's perfectly happy it's certainly not dead it's nice and green underneath there so it's really basically just gone into like a forced dormancy and i think it won't do that over in the mediterranean perhaps if i've got any mediterranean viewers they can tell me but I've never actually seen a bougainvillea. I've not actually been to the Mediterranean at this time of year, but I don't believe I've seen a bougainvillea that's lost all its leaves uh, in the Mediterranean. I think they tend to keep them. Um, and of course, you're talking there, they tend to be much bigger plants with much bigger root systems. Um, but maybe it's just because those temperatures are not down to 12 degrees or lower for an extended length of time they do get even in december and january in the med you do tend to get the odd day where it's bright sunshine in fact not the odd day many days where it's bright sunshine the temperatures can easily reach 15. so maybe that's the issue i don't know and now i'm walking around the problem is when when you're doing a video like this and you pick things up and then you're walking around with dead leaves in your hand so i shall just have to bin off these leaves and that'll free me up okay so you can see that the cyclamen are all looking <coughs> really nice. They're ready for a water again. And I, how can I tell? Well, I can see how they begin to flop a little bit. Some of these are in really small pots and uh, they're drying out very quickly. <coughs> it doesn't help that the, uh, the fan is directly on them. So, yeah, we were talking about things losing the leaves. Uh, the Brugmansia has lost practically every single leaf, but there are one or two little buds happening. It will come back. Oh, the spider's moved. You see that spider there? Let's see if I can zoom in on it. There it is. Just there. I feel really sorry for spiders in the greenhouse. This time of year, because it's all closed up, there's not much food around. I'm sure it'll survive because it won't be long before I'll have to get the vents back open and unfettered. There's a leaf. There we go. Um, this, this particular plant, this Brugmansia, is a martyr to spider mite. Not, not big spiders, spider mite when it's in leaf, when it's in the greenhouse. And I can spray it all alike, and that certainly does knock the spider mite back. But they still they still seem to return you know, within a matter of weeks. The only thing that really gets rid of the spider mite is when it goes outside. That just completely solves the problem, because obviously it's wet and very humid out there anyway. I mean, it's humid in here. It's 85% at the moment. So, the Sotoanum is still doing brilliantly well. It's really nice to get this kind of bloom at this time of year. This is much nicer than it looked last year. Uh, it only had a couple of spikes on it last year, so I'm quite pleased with that. And we solved the sooty mould problem. Uh, it was just basically, well, it, it was just too damp, it must have been. And since I sprayed it with a fungicide, that seems to have solved that problem. Great to see the pelagoniums coming into bloom. If you watch Mr. Pelagonium, David Taylor, um, he'll tell you to stop his uh, to stop your pelagoniums at this time of year but obviously he shows them i don't show them i'm quite happy to get blooms from pelagoniums at this time of year and this is one of my favorite ones this one this sound side fringed aztec this is an absolutely stunning bloom and i'm very very happy to see it in bloom at this time of year i've actually been around and fed them all um, they've, they've already been shaped they've been cut back because as we know pelagoniums like to produce leaves and the more leaves they produce so, okay if you don't cut them back like november december time and um, then they just get very leggy and they produce loads and loads of leaves and less blooms so you really need to cut them back to this kind of size and uh, make them nice and compact and then you get blooms like that i mean this one's going over a bit now but this is just you think it was the middle of august but it's great to have it this time of year because when there's no lack of blooms when it comes around to the summer months so we might as well make the most of them in january and february this one this nepenthes you can just begin to see the colors on the peristome there so this one is a, a, a cross between lowy eye and ventricosa now lowy eye is a, a very famous nepenthes it's a, a really odd shape i think lowy eye is the one that the little shrew uh, licks the the lid and then defecates into the uh, into the picture but uh, i mean this looks nothing like the lowy eye but uh, it's certainly a nice, going to be a nice peristome. You can imagine when that's really big, it's going to be very, very nice. So what else have we got going on here? My Epidendrum ballerina, looking very happy. Really nice blooms on that. Second blooming for me, that one. 
Uh, we're going to talk about watering dendrobiums and resting them in a moment. I'm sure lots of people might be interested in my take on that. It's not very exciting, my take on it, but uh, it's a take. It's an opinion, nevertheless. So what else have we got? Would you believe... Now, this one, this is my Shari Baby, uh, the older one, the first one I got. That actually came from Thailand, when you could still do that kind of thing. At least I think you could. Um, I did it anyway, nevertheless. Bought it off eBay, came from Thailand, and uh, it flowered for me that first year. Or was it the second year? Could have been the second year. And you can see a spike on it. It completely missed a year, and then it's uh, it's bloomed for me, or it's going to bloom for me again. So I'm really happy about that. Get yeah, happy about these things, don't you, when you're a plant person? This that Ed gave me is just the plant that keeps on giving. I, I've run out of... <laughs> superlatives right the, the number of flowers and blooms it's gave me over this well since ed gave it me uh, when would he have given it me i don't know if i've actually written it down it's a long long time since well it's not that long then from ed on 9th of the 11th 2019 oh, so it's quite a while back isn't it it's uh it's getting on it's got another bloom coming another spike there every time i think it's finished it comes and throws another one up very older is about to come into bloom. That's marvellous. As I say, cyclamen all looking wonderful. Really like this one. I love all the different shades on it. Um, that one's going over a little bit. It just needs deadheading. You know, you'd think I'd not been in the greenhouse for days on end. It's two days since I came in, and already there's like loads of stuff that needs doing. So that white one's just coming in now. That that had a a bit of a, an attack of botrytis, so I'm quite pleased that that's now coming back into uh, its, its full force of bloomage. So I'll show these, don't I? So these are my sundews, so you can see how much ugh, I'm sticking to it. Ah, don't eat me, sundew. So if I just lift that up. I think that sundews are the kind of thing that just don't show up well on camera, but when you see them in in reality, they there's, there's much more to them because your eyes can focus on these beautiful little dew drops and for some reason the camera won't and I, I think you just don't get the same effect. So this is Drosera binata variety multifida, multifida, multifida and it's really, really come on now. They can go dormant. A lot of people say, oh, well, my, my Drosera, my sundew has died. Well, just before you throw it away, make sure that it's not gone dormant. They can go dormant. That doesn't mean that they absolutely have to. And if you keep them uh, over 12 degrees, or keep them a little bit warmer, then they won't go dormant. So that one has. This one's just beginning to get going now. That one down there I chopped off because it just started getting the uh, botrytis. It should come back. So I suppose we'll find out, won't we, sooner or later. Um, so... Yeah, I've put some feed now in all the streptocarpus, so they're looking good. This one, so th this is this is a, a fern here, it's a Terrace Critica, and I nearly threw it out. I tried it in all sorts of different positions, and it just wasn't happy until I chucked it under the bench with the intention of throwing it out. <laughs> Would you believe that's what it wants to be? It wants to be under the bench in the dark. So if anyone has one of those, that's the kind of conditions it likes. Not Critica, it's Enciformis, Terris Enciformis. I beg your pudding. I can't remember the name of every plant. Yeah, so Plorothalis, still doing all right. It's not brilliant, but I, I, I think it's one of those plants that you just need uh, a great big specimen to have anything interesting to look at. It has bloomed, if you can call it a bloom. I think it's that one of those plants I love to hate. But I still can't throw it out for whatever reason. I can't throw it out. So, my Dracula. So, come on, Dracula people. Tell me, is this a spike or is it not a spike? I think that's a spike. I'm just looking at the top there. Can you follow it there? Right from the base. Um, it just comes sticking straight out. It's a spike, isn't it? Now, it doesn't mean to say that it won't blast for me. I know what these things are like. They're a little bit temperamental. Well, I think I've got the perfect conditions for Draculas. Um, my Master Valleys do pretty well in this climate, so hopefully that will be my first Dracula spike. 
Um, we'll come around to dendrobiums in a minute. Actually, this is a dendrobium. So this is Farmer Eye, but it is. It had a couple of new growths on it when I bought it, but they seem to be rotting off for whatever reason. Um, I can't remember whether it's winter resting one or whatever. So yeah, we'll talk about the winter resting ones, the ones that I know that should winter rest. So I've got a nobly over here. Um, had a little orchid society. Uh, meet up last week and it was and the RHS I think it was Wisley a guy at Wisley horticulturalist at Wisley and I asked him the question he was talking about dendrobium kingianums and mine has done nothing this year it's produced loads of roots but it doesn't seem like it wants to bloom this year which is a shame because I really liked that one last year um, and it, I said well look do you do you rest them do they get a winter rest and he said well yes and no and I gave the answer that really I was kind of working to anyway. It was, yes, you give them a lot less water. Yes, you give them a rest, except. So when we're looking at things like dendrobiums that supposedly are a dry winter rest, if something changes in the plant, then you've got to respond. So for example, I'm just looking at this nobly here and we've got buds on it. Not just nubbins, we've got buds. So those buds will blast unless I water this plant. It might be a little bit early for them. It might be the wrong time of year. But let's face it, I don't want to lose some blooms. So that plant needs a water. And that's the kind of idea that I'm going towards. If I can see that the temperatures are changing, the light intensity is changing, the plant is changing. Now, this is either for the better or for the worse. So if the plant really begins to shrivel up, then I would give it some water. If those nubbins turn into buds and they look like they want to bloom, then I would give it some water. So really, just like when you're watering anything, I think, my thinking at the moment with winter resting dendrobiums is to take my cue from what's going on with the plant. So over here, great big uh, specimen plant of uh, dendrobium nobly. Can you see how it's got some buds and that bud is about to blast? Why? Because I'd not watered it because I was giving it a winter rest. And it was only when I kind of took a second look or had a, a second think about it I thought you know what this is ridiculous these these are going to bloom why go and prevent it from blooming by keeping the thing bone dry it's ready it's got loads of buds loads of new growths on it that tells me that it's ready to do something so I've given it a water and hopefully that will come into bloom now I don't know if it's going to do like that mass blooming like it did last year that was absolutely superb and of course, what we're also contending with is the fact that a lot of these plants are, bought it, are brought into bloom at the wrong time anyway, just to sell them in the shops. And whether you can actually get them back into the natural rhythm, I don't know. But of course, they're not in a natural place. Are they? They're in a greenhouse in the north of England. So really, I'm not bothered. As long as they bloom and they keep blooming regularly, that's really all I care about. I don't care whether it's the right time of year or not. So all medendrobiums that are meant to get a winter rest, I've given them a really dry spell. I'm going to keep a close eye on them. And if anything happens to them, then I'm going to respond. Uh, for example, and this is a, another couple that I did a video on. So these ones. So this one is, and I can't remember. I've not looked at it for that long. The Densiflorum and what was the other one? Well, let's just whiz around here. Apologies for that. Uh, this one is the Thirsiflorum. So both of these, and I'm going to go back to the Densiflorum just to give you another little headache. Both of these uh, are winter resting ones. And by the way, I really should have put them in a basket, shouldn't I? So when something actually happens to them, I'm going to put them in a basket. As far as I can see at the moment, nothing has changed since I bought these plants. They've done nothing. I can't see nubbins. I can see kind of a swollen bit at the top there, but that was, that was there when, they, uh, when I bought them. I don't think they've shriveled enough. There's kind of a little bit shriveled, but nothing too major. They were already fairly shriveled. I don't think that's ready for getting some water just yet. Eventually, I'll put them in baskets. Why baskets? Because these are like pendulous blooms, aren't they? So they're going to hang down. So I think really they need to go in baskets. But at the moment, we just have to wait and see if anything happens to them and i'm not going to water them until anything does happen to them okay so while we're over here uh, these pink tradescanti i know i mentioned this last time the pink wandering dews 
this particular one, so this is Maiden's Blush, and there's another one over there, um, and I, I cut all the lower growth off because I wanted to see if I could get the, this pink to come. I've since found a really, really good resource. I think I mentioned it last time. And, but it was it's from a grower in the US, and uh, I think they're a, like a seller of these things. And basically what happens with the pink varieties or this particular one, not the Nanook Lilac, we're talking about Maiden's Blush, Blushing Bride, I think it's Tredescansi Fluminensis, plus those, those names. Oh, look at that there, see. I wonder if that could be food for my fly. Can you see? Food for my fly. Food for my spider friend there. Or it might be food for one of the fly traps. So you do get uh, I do get flies in at this time of year. Perhaps it snuck in when I got when I opened the doors. So yeah, these particular ones, these fluminensis that have this pink on the tip, they only do that once a year. And according to this resource, I don't know how right this is, I've no reason to assume it's incorrect, seeing as that they are a, a grower and a seller. This is caused by a virus, and it only comes into uh, action once every year. So for the rest of the year, the plant is green. It's like a glossy green like this. Um, now that might, for you, might make it into a plant that you don't really want. But when it does come nice and pink like that, it looks really nice. So rather than cut off all the green bits, you just leave it. You leave it to grow, and then at a certain time of the year, it'll come pink. Now, apparently, it needs the cooler temperatures to do that. The one that I've got in the warmer side, because I was experimenting, has gone pink, despite the fact that it's kept at 17, 18 degrees. But I don't think it's as good a pink as what we've got there. So, yeah, that's that. Uh, anybody who's a banana favourite, favourite of bananas? So this is actually the false banana and the Abyssinian banana. And I've hardly watered this. In fact, I've practically given it nothing at all for at least a month and a half. Just a little trickle. And it's been absolutely fine, not worried. And it's brought a nice new leaf out. So that knows that spring is coming. Okay, so where are we? So these Dendrobium Cuthbertsoni are still looking really nice. They, ha they have been losing a few leaves, going a little bit yellow. I'm not sure whether I'm doing something wrong there. I'm being very careful to make sure that this does dry out um, briefly anyway. And then it can be ready for another water. Oh, Mr. Spider, I'm going to have to destroy your home there to give that a water. Um, still looking nice. Still looking beautiful. And by the way, if you caught the one on Twinkle Cinnamon, I did actually cut the blooms off. Uh, I don't know what the heck I've done with the plant. It's around somewhere. Um, it's over in its coconut husks over here still looking the same I don't think it's got any new roots as of yet but I wouldn't expect it because it was only a week ago it's not dead though is it not yet not yet so where were we yeah so um, let's move along so I would uh, no here we go sorry I don't know what I'm talking about so this is this is my other sundew looking good uh, we've got the one bloom there on the snowbird. That's got some new growth coming down there, so that's okay since it's repot. I'm quite happy about that. That's put on loads of leaves. This is the Mastervalia ignea. But so far, and I noticed mix, mix, one of mixed Mastervalias is blooming now, but so far there are no bloom spikes on that. Now, because it's putting so many leaves on, I would expect they will come at some point. It had a brilliant blooming last year. So that was the cyclamen that had the tarsonamid mite. Unfortunately, after spraying it, we've got some mutations you can see there. Um, I could cut them off at some point, but let's let, let it get into bloom first before I do. That's just what happens. There's, there's no way around that, I don't think, unless you go the organic route, and I don't think that will get rid of tarsonamid mite. Curly fire flush, begonia curly fire, fire flush, looking great, looking great. Some of these begonias don't seem to mind going down to these temperatures. We'll have a talk about some of the ones at the other side in a minute. And my very first streptocarpus in bloom, so this is Bethan, looking absolutely beautiful, really nice to get this into bloom now. Notice how the streptocarpus, I've got all the nice green leaves again, because they were looking really sad, weren't they, last year, at the end of last year, with all the kind of yellowing leaves. Um, yeah, this one is Solimutata, Begonia Solimutata, doesn't seem to mind. We've just got the one kind of browning leaf, but the rest of it, we've got new growth there. It's quite happy at 12. The eyelash Begonia, Begonia Bowerai is 
in bloom, if you can call those blooms. Uh, I may well cut them off. I'll just have a little look at them for a bit because they are quite hairy and fuzzy. I like fuzzy things. Okay, my sundews, not sundews, my pinguiculars. So this was based on a, a tip from Matt Soper from Hans Flytraps. Use one of these. He says that they don't really like to sit in water. And actually, they look a lot healthier now that I've took them out of the water and put them on one of these. I know that one's looking a bit pathetic. You can see the old rosettes died off and we've got some new ones coming. This one is going to bloom. That'll be nice. I want to see some big plants on these. This is one of the bigger... Uh, bigger leaved pinguiculars, so this is Guatemala. That one is Cross of Wessa. Um, I went for the bigger ones because they're not much to look at otherwise. Okay, so everything I think that we need to discuss, we have already discussed in this side of the greenhouse. Let me just check before we move on. Now I think we're done here, so let's move through to the warm side because there's a little bit more going on in the warmer side oh just before we do notice this flabodium look at all the new fronds coming on that now tons of new growth coming on that and um, it even though i know flabodiums grow in florida in hot dry places and grow off trees and they like it really warm for some reason mine didn't seem to appreciate the sun at the end of last year. I mean, don't forget, it's through glass and through, even though it's shaded, through glass is a completely different beast to when it's out in the open and it's got all the, the ventilation and the shade. And I don't know, for whatever reason anyway, they, they really went south right towards the end of last year. And I've cut a lot of the blackening fronds off. But since... We've been in winter, they've been really coming on again. New fronds everywhere. And of course, I'm still feeding them. Um, I did. I was told by Laura, I think it was, that they really, really appreciate a good feed. And Laura knows what she's talking about. Listen to her. She's in the business. Oh, gosh, I'm just... I keep wrecking my sundews with all the... I try to move them and then I get covered in dew. They think I'm a giant fly. So we got through to... Sorry, I'm waffling a bit today. We go through to the warmer side. Um, yeah, waffling a bit, not just today, as always, as we know from my latest video. So there are things happening over here, wonderful things, marvellous things. First thing to look at, look at the size of that hippiastrum. It is a big one, I know, and I've kept it fed and I've, it's, uh, it's in a nice big pot. But that is, I think every, every year I think this is probably the biggest it's ever been, but it is really big. And over here, the smaller, this is Papio, Papio, I think. Uh, this was a new one, uh, Michael's suggestion. And I think Rachel has one as well. So yeah, we're talking about that Tredescantia. So you can see some pink there, but more green because it's not had that cold. So it may be it needs to be over in the other side and a bit colder. Um, I, yeah, we've talked about this loads of times, um, but that's coming back. Look at the new growth. So basically, the only problem with that was that I wasn't watering it. <laughs> and it needs another water now. I've not been in the greenhouse for a few days, believe it or not, since weekend. And uh, what are we doing? What are we? Thursday now. So things are beginning to need a little bit of attention. This is doing really well, this uh, Elizabeth Ann Buckleberry, since I moved it into this position and tried to keep it wet. It's chucking leaves up all over the place. So that's got to bloom this year. Absolutely got to. Right, we're going to talk about Burragira nelliyla or Oncidopsis nelliyla. This is Swiss beauty. So I have a bone to pick with Michael, <laughs> if he's watching. So anyway, this, this was over in the cool side, okay? 12 degrees last year. Now, when it got to very early March, we had a week of... Uh, sunshine and I didn't have the shade up. Now, my problem at the time or my thoughts were that it was going south as you can see it is now. Look at all that growth, all that greenery that's now turning br into brownery. We don't say that, do we? Brownery, greenery, brownery, uh, deadery. <laughs> it's going dead. Not looking its best, is it? Apart from the bloom. So I think there are this is another one I'm going to have to cut off. And what happened was it started to go like this and the con I said it's because it's cold and the consensus, uh, I think Michael suggested it, and the consensus also between some of the people was it's been burnt, burnt by the sun. However, 
it's done the exact same thing again and it's had not one drop of sun so i'm wondering whether and i'm not getting anybody here because i'm wrong plenty of times as everybody knows i still think it's the cold but i think it's the cold over a length of time i don't think because i think this is more of an intermediate one anyway and i think it can take down to about 10 degrees but not day after day after day i think if it has the odd little drop to 12 degrees but then during the day it goes up again to like 15 plus talking celsius here then i think it's probably all right but it's been at 12 degrees through november most of november all december all january so that's at least two months possibly even three and you can see what's happened to it it's beginning to lose color it's beginning to go brown leaves are beginning to drop off it doesn't like it last year uh, it was again it was about two weeks into march i brought it back into this side it slowly recovered and it bloomed it bloomed two or three times and as you can see it's still in bloom just about but not for much longer um so it does recover but it, it so it's an intermediate i reckon that's what i think anyway and unfortunately i only have the cooler side and the warmer side i don't have an intermediate side so that means i've got to move these plants over when they start to head south so that that's my thoughts on that anyway whether it's right or not i don't know it rescued it last year hopefully it'll rescue it this year Caleria is another one to discuss. Now, look how nice that caleria has gone. Look how big it's gone. And that's because I didn't give it uh, a dormant period. So these come from South America, if I recall correctly. And they don't actually get a dormant period. Now, if you look at the information on caleria from people who sell them in this country, they will say, yes, give it a dormant period. Uh, they can go, they're a bit like sundews, they can go dormant and they'll be perfectly fine going dormant and then you can regrow them again. But if you have the conditions, don't let them. They, if, As long as they're kept above 18 degrees, you can chop them right back and they will come right back at you again. Same with that one, that's not growing quite as fast. I'm losing a couple of leaves there. Uh, in fact, I keep, it needs a lot more water than I'm giving it at the moment. I need to up the watering. I think that's probably partly to do with the watering. Okay, so where are we? This here, this is my Thunbergia alata, which was over on the other side there, uh, the other side of the, of the warm side, and uh, it, that's coming nice again. You know, that's just it's just one of those plants that for some reason it's, it just doesn't seem happy wherever I chuck it, so I'm going to put it in a different place, looking happier again. Tredescantia, this is another one that I've restarted. I keep taking those green shoots out because I don't want them... Uh, what it's not producing for me yet is the variegated ones. We've got the cream and the green, but none of the variegated. So I'm going to keep taking out those uh, green ones until I get some variegated uh, ones again. So what else? What else? What else? What else? That plumeria. So this is one one of those that, that uh, is martyr to red spider mite. That one hasn't gone dormant. The other one has. The other one's lost practically all its leaves now. I've moved the hoya into the corner because it never blooms for me now look at this so this is my rebecca sopa look at this huge picture that's the biggest picture i've ever had on an apenthes now i know other people can get them much bigger than this but that's the biggest i've had big nice flowed peristome at the top there really pleased with that one and this couple of spooning uh spooning pictures here they're going to be quite big as well. That one might be as big as that one eventually. But it's it's sister clone because they actually divided them over here. That one's lost all its pictures now practically. So hopefully that one will come back as a new one there. Um, Flobodium on a stick, doing quite well. That's okay. So yeah, what are we talking about? So begonias. So uh, we've got the whitey eye, which is now coming back. So I shows that I doesn't like the cooler temperatures down to 12. The Listada looking really nice again now. This is an asparagus fern, which I don't really like that much. So this is asparagus cetaceous. And I hated it that much actually that I chopped it right back. You can see the sticks there that I chopped it back to. And it come back. So that shows you can actually chop back asparagus ferns. What I don't like, can you see the one in the front in the middle that's all yellowing? Well, that tends to be what, what happens to me for some reason. It, it just keeps dropping all those little spines and it gets very, very messy. 
so yeah the luxurians so the palm leaved begonia we know so far it doesn't like to be in those cooler temperatures and this is a similar thing again like i was talking to you about the oncidopsis nelly isla um, even though the books say it can go down to 12 degrees i did find some information which kind of backed up what i'm beginning to think now is that it doesn't like that over like a uh, day after day after day it, it it will do it it will go down to 10 doesn't like it below 10 but only as a as a one-off or a couple of times it doesn't like that permanently and over in my cooler side it was permanently at 12 degrees and it just lost bottom leaf next one up next one up and even that one's beginning to go yellow it's just kind of held off a little bit now but i'm hoping as these light as the light intensity improves this leaf down here will come and it will begin to uh, re-sprout hopefully um, this little uh, phalaenopsis we do have a name for this now thanks to my class it's good for some stuff well, it's good for lots of stuff actually a uh, phalaenopsis long prague gold staff and that looks really nice that's the, been it will be in, have been in bloom for a year and it's produced another new spike actually that was his also his suggestion to uh, get rid of the big heavy moss covering that i had and it's been better since then um i don't think i've any sign of anything on my uh drosera regia yet it did say a couple of weeks if you can spot anything there there is a little bit of greenery off to the right there but i don't i think that looks like a piece of moss yeah so that plumeria has lost all its leaves unfortunately there's only one left now i'm hoping that starts to come back again so i've got some buds on my blc i didn't think that would bloom so this is blc i can't remember this is though this is the Xingfong little sun golden young ming golden boy god what a name so blooms blooms or buds 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 hopefully i thought they were empty because when they came up they were really flat and i thought oh, these are just empty sheaths but they've come back for me thankfully so yeah the mandevilla hasn't actually lost all its bloom still got a couple of blooms there and this beautiful cattleya lovely scent to it this is quite a long-lasting bloom. I just keep imagining what this cattle will look like when it's got loads of these on it. It's going to look stunning, isn't it? So, yeah, um, I think I have covered everything. Um, told you there was lots to talk about, so I'm really happy with the way things are developing. I, I do have a Vanda. I was looking at one of Todd's Vandas this morning. It was absolutely stunning Vanda. And I've only ever bought one, and all it does is produce roots is still not yet and this is probably into the third year now still not yet produced a bloom for me and if i can get a bloom on this then i'll probably be a little bit more inclined to get another one um, i certainly like that the one that he showed me this morning was the best vander i've ever seen it was the most gorgeous vander um over on his channel there so i think that is your lot you might have noticed those of you who keep up to date with these things that there is a gap there well there's not i've put something else in its place i had my miltoniopsis over there and i had an intention of showing it on the uh, the orchid society zoom call thing but uh, i never got around to it so it's actually in the kitchen but it looks brilliant in the kitchen at the moment with its four or five flower spikes and that's the other miltoniopsis that i had that i bought like towards the end of last year and uh, i'm still jury's still out whether i can keep that one going and make that one thrive let's hope that i can so that is all the news that's going on at the moment and as you can see things change very rapidly at this time of year few days and something's changed or something needs doing it's a it's a constant source of uh, like drain on my time but it's also a constant joy um, to to be able to come in here and see and i can't spend as much time as i really would like because of other things going on as well not least of which is editing all these flipping videos that i make uh, well that you know that's my own fault i do that as well for for other reasons but it's great to be able to come in here and see greenery to see bloom to see growth to see new life because to me that's what growing plants is all about and it's uh, uh, like i say it's a constant source of joy especially in these lockdown times we've been locked down now for several months 
well several months it, it's for us in, in my part of the country we we've been at like the highest tier for at least eight months but the the full country has been in lockdown since the beginning of january and it's just the worst time of year isn't it the last one that we had or one that we had in summer was great when it was all nice sunny weather well not great but you know what i mean it was better because you could get outside but at this time of year it's just horrendous it's constantly wet it's constantly miserable and dull and to come in here just takes your mind off it for a little bit so I definitely recommend it. But of course, I'm preaching to the converted, aren't I? So that's all I've got time for today. I'm sorry if I waffled and rambled and didn't cut the waffle and get to the point. But I've shown you everything that's going on at the moment. And I hope you enjoyed it along with me or as much as I enjoy actually talking about them. So for now, I'll see you on the next one. Bye. <laughs>